Good morning guys, welcome to another day. Today is May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Cinco de Mayo. It's, um, a lot of people think Cinco de Mayo is like the 4th of July. Uh, they both are holidays, they both have the name of the date in the holiday, but they are actually rather different. Uh, so, the 4th of July is the American Independence Day, the celebration of us signing the Declaration of Independence, not actually achieving independence, but the beginning to that process. Cinco de Mayo, however, is for Mexican independence, but not actually the same thing. It was just based on a single battle, and not even one that was significant. It was more of a symbolic situation. So, the year was 1861. The Mexican, um, Mexican government was having their troubles. The United States, we were just starting our civil war, but Mexicans had had a civil war going on for three years, and they're just coming out of it. And at the end of it, they had, they owed a lot of money. During the civil war, they were borrowing money from England and France and Spain, and over the course of that, uh, they were spending that money and they weren't earning new money. It was not like where the United States, they had some parts of the United States that were doing well financially and other parts that were doing poor. This was where they were going to have a lot of bills that they just couldn't pay. And what happens when you can't pay a bill? Well, the people that you owe the money to come to collect it. And in this case, that's exactly what they did. France and England and Spain were planning on coming to collect the money that was due them. If you can't pay us in actual money, we'll find something else that we can take. So France was coming over with some ships and some troops and they were going to take something. And what they were going to do, they were going to take some land. So they were going to take some land and the battle uh, that Cinco de Mayo is about is about keeping Mexico Mexican. They were going to try to keep the French out, keep the French from taking it. The name of the battle is the Battle of Puebla. And it's one of those underdog stories where you've got 6,000 French troops coming in and 2,000 ragtag Mexican just gathered people from the villages that, that could help fight. Uh, they were ill-equipped, they were outnumbered, and yet somehow they were able to fight off the, uh, the French and preserve the day, so, to save the day. It didn't end the war and it went on for several more years, but it was a symbolic victory that the Mexicans um, hold dear to their, their patriotism that they can feel good about being able to keep Mexico Mexican. All right, I'm going to start off today a little bit with talking about the news that went out yesterday from the district regarding grading. Uh, we're going to finish out the year with a policy of pass or no mark. Pass means you passed the class. No mark means I'm not going to say whether you passed or not, you just don't have any mark, which in some cases looks like you failed, but it's, um, it could be also equivalent to an incomplete. Basically, you haven't shown that you've scored well in that area, so we're not going to give you a mark. Um, it's supposed to be based on what scores you had in the trimester before the shutdown. And now for this class, um, it's a little bit different. If you were passing before the shutdown, like in your other classes, and you had, had a, a A, a B, or a C, uh, or a D, you'd be passing and you'd still be passing. You just want to make, make sure you maintain that. Then if you um, weren't passing, then you have a chance that you can bring that up during quarantine by doing the work and making sure that you're showing that you're doing the work. That's really where it comes down to. For our class, uh, you didn't have any scores before I met you, before before I started teaching you. There was nothing entered into the grade book, so none of you were passing, or failing for that matter. So it's gonna be a little bit different. I'll have to check into how that works, but uh, I think it's gonna, probably gonna be along the lines of if you're participating or not. Uh, if I can sh show that you're participating during quarantine, then we will give you a pass, and if you're not, then it's going to be a no mark. Uh, you want to keep your stress levels low though. I, this is a tough time for a lot of people, some people more than others, and I know I've said this before, but you need to keep working, learning, watching, thinking, growing. That's, that's my goal for you. 
those are the types of things you should be doing. And for different people, that's going to look differently. For some of you, it means the pressure is off and you can learn without pressure. You can explore and enjoy. For others, you may quit entirely. You may say that um, there's no penalty. I'm not going to keep trying. Choose what's best for you. The reason for this policy is the pandemic. The reason for this policy, it's an unusual situation with a lot of things out of your control. A lot of things out of my control. I can't guarantee that you're getting the best explanation in the classroom. I can't walk over to your desk and give you a little extra help or you can't just raise your hand and ask a question as you're going through something. Yes, there are ways to reach out. There are ways to communicate, but it's not the same. And I don't know what your home life is. I don't know like, Right now, I'm doing homeschooling with my daughter, one daughter, while I'm at home, and that's tough. I'll be honest, yesterday was a really tough day. Uh, patience levels were running thin. Um, I was up really early to get stuff out for you, and then the day dragged on and on because we didn't finish everything in the time that we thought we'd finish it. And that's with one kid. Can you imagine a house that has more than one kid trying to do homeschooling, uh, maybe with an infant, maybe with uh, one or more adults that are in the house that are trying to work from home? That's got to be a really tough situation to work in. So we're being flexible with this policy so that we understand not everybody is coming out from the same, same set of resources. So if you can, keep working your brain. Keep growing, keep developing. There may not be an academic penalty for slacking off, but your, if your brain turns to mush, it's gonna be really tough after six months of not using it to come back and jump back into the school game. Uh, so do what you can, choose what's best for you. Challenging yourself to learn new things. Right now, I think I mentioned earlier, um, I, I put it to myself to a challenge to learn some new dance moves. I'm learning cutting shapes, some shuffle, some, I don't know, some other things. Um, and I showed you a little bit of that before, and I'll show you some more as I, as I develop, but I'm feeling kind of clumsy right now, honestly, but, um, but it's fun, and I feel good about getting exercise, I feel good about learning something new. That's just, that's, that's my goal. Make sure that I'm still growing and developing as a person, and if you can't learn academically, you can't grow academically, grow in another way. Figure out something that, that can pursue yourself and be a greater version of the you that you are. Uh, because when we all get out of this pandemic, I want to see, uh, I want to see what kind of person you've become. And I know you guys are going to be amazing, and you keep on doing what you're going to do, and that's all up to you. All right, coming soon, a little later today, hopefully. Um, I've got the script written, but I haven't, uh, haven't filmed it yet. Another special edition quarantine video. Uh, yesterday I was getting you ready for high school and beyond, thinking about what kind of classes you should take, what all of that uh, prerequisite and elective and required classes stuff means. And today I'm gonna to talk about the careers that you might like, so picking out what you wanna do for the rest of your life. Uh, it's a tough choice and doing a little research will help you. All right, our lesson for the day. Lesson for the day is how did the black codes affect, affect the freedmen in the South? Black codes were the laws that limited the rights of African Americans after the end of the Civil War. They varied from state to state and county to county, but they all had the same effect. They were limiting the rights of African Americans. The people that had been slaves were now free. The federal government said, you can't have slavery anymore. And so the southern states said, okay, well, if they can't be slaves, well, they definitely can't be equal to us, and we need them to be working for us the way that they were when they were slaves, so let's just make some laws that limit them to those roles. They were really working hard to make sure that there was as little change as possible. Federal government, Reconstruction, we're trying to make as much change as possible, and the South is pushing back. The Southern leaders are putting laws into place to make sure that those changes have almost no effect. Uh, so blacks were ba basically moving from slavery into citizenship, but second-class citizenship, meaning a lower level of citizenship, not having the same rights as black people, or as white people. Uh, so when one injustice is fixed, another one is put into place. So they say, you, I can't have slaves anymore? Okay, well, I'll hire these people to work for me. Um, you have to pay them. Okay, great, I will pay them. Is there a law that says how much I have to pay them? No? Oh, okay, well, I'll keep that in mind. I don't have to pay them very much. Is there a law that limits how much I can make them work? No, no law. Okay, I can make them work as much as I want. Great. 
can we put a law into place that says that they have to have a labor contract with somebody? Okay, so they started to put labor laws in, laws that said that a black person has to sign a labor contract at the beginning of the year, committing themselves to one employer, and they would do whatever that employer said for that year. That sounds like they would have to sign themselves into slavery every year. That's effectively slavery. But it was under the guise of being a free person signing a labor contract. Examples of black codes. You could restrict property and business ownership. You, like you wouldn't be allowed to own certain types of property. You wouldn't be allowed to take part in certain types of businesses. You couldn't vote. You would still be limited in education. Your ability to move through public spaces would be limited. You, who you could work for. Some people had laws that, some counties had laws that you could only work for people that you used to be a slave to. That's ridiculous, right? Blacks could only work in ag agriculture or as household help. Again, the former jobs that would be held, held by slaves were now being held by former slaves that were limited to those types of jobs. And part of this was the, the South really felt that they needed that labor force still there. Like, how are, you, how are we going to raise cotton if we don't have slaves? And if they all choose to be uh, bookstore owners and shoemakers, then what are we going to do for the, the needs of our plantations? Are we going to hire a bunch of white people that are going to work? I, that, that probably doesn't sound reasonable. And there was some pride here because the white people of the South thought that there was a d different level of citizenship, that the blacks were less than whites and they should have laws to keep them in their, in their place. Uh, one prime example of this and I want you, that I want you to look at is the Vagrancy Act. Vagrancy is the act of being either unemployed or homeless or both. And this act made it a crime that if you were homeless, if you were a vagrant, you would be committing a crime. So they could arrest you, they could put you in a penalty, we give you a, give you a fine, like say you have to pay $200, and of course if you're homeless and you're unemployed, you don't have $200. So you need to be auctioned off to somebody who will agree to pay your fine until you've paid that back to them, and you would have to do whatever they say for that period of time. That is like, just like the slave auctions. You would be basically, through a legal process, put into a slave auction and become a slave again. This was one of those legal loopholes that the South was looking for left and right. How can we still make these people act like slaves? Slave codes, slave codes, not black codes, but slave codes had been around for hundreds of years. Slave codes were a very common thing, limiting, okay, you can't, you can't teach a slave to read and write, that's illegal, you can't have a slave own property, you can't have, sometimes the slaves wouldn't be able to, to marry or um, they wouldn't be able to have rights to their children, things like that. Slave codes got transferred into black codes, so as we move to the end of the Civil War, what used to be a slave code is now put into place on the legal books as a black code. And in some cases, it was just a matter of changing the wording from slave to black. They had no legal rights. You couldn't sue in court. If you were a black person and a white person did something wrong for you, you, could, you couldn't sue them because any legal testimony you gave wouldn't count because you were black. Anybody who was white automatically had more legal grounds than you. They were more believable than you just based on the color of your skin. So black codes were the same oppression as the slave codes, but now they had a slightly different name. As we move beyond Reconstruction, the name for these becomes the Jim Crow laws. And Jim Crow was not just laws, but a series of cultural norms, a cultural codes of, of of agreements among society in the South that would limit the freedoms of blacks. And we'll talk about this more in U.S. history in high school, but Jim Crow laws were things like uh, you, if you were black, you couldn't reach out your hand to shake hands with a white person because that would suggest that you guys were equal. And that would be against the, the whole norms of understanding that blacks and whites were unequal and blacks were second-class citizens and that was something that the South wanted to maintain. They wanted to maintain something called segregation where blacks and whites were on two separate sides of the line and you couldn't have them mixed. It has been a long, 
hall trying to get equal rights for everyone in the United States and this is one more step in that process and it's not been a quick fix and like we've been discovering as we study reconstruction fighting a civil war for it and coming out at the end of the civil war didn't solve the problem it didn't make everybody free and equal uh, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, we hold these rights to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, we're still working towards that ideal and in some cases there's a lot of people that don't want that ideal. And is that something that we're really working for? Is that something that it's arguable that complete equality is not, uh, not our goal? Is there a reason that people don't want equality? And that's, that's those are some questions to ponder because uh, we have some interesting rationale for why somebody would want an unequal situation. Uh, the injustices of the black codes is our, our theme for today. And I want you to take a look at the, the links that I'm providing on, there's a video about this, the black codes and what happened to children of blacks that were, were were arrested based on these black codes, what would happen to the children. Take a look at the Vagrancy Act of 1866, and uh, and that's all, all for today. You're still working on your packet. Make sure you log in to Google Classroom um, to see what the assignments are, and log in to Schoology to get your attendance taken. And I'll talk to you more tomorrow. Have a great day. Stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye.